Does creating life in a petri dish sound scary to you? Not to me. I'll tell you why. How do we create life in the lab? This is the University of the Netherlands. What is life? This is still a question that remains unanswered and depending on who you ask, a poet, an artist or a scientist, the answer will differ. There are many definitions of life, but it's always possible to find an exception to the rule. Let's consider the widely used NASA definition of life, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, a popular and often effective definition. However, let's consider the case of mules, the majority of which cannot create offspring. These animals are surely considered to be alive, yet if they cannot reproduce, then they cannot undergo Darwinian evolution. Regardless of the exact definition, the most basic and smallest form of life we know is a single cell. Therefore, in the lab, we try to create living cells from scratch as an ultimate goal. There is still a lot we don't know about how living systems operate. But if we can build a living system from the bottom up, then we'll have a much deeper understanding of life. Or, as Richard Feynman says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Our current understanding of biology is like knowing how to drive a car versus knowing how to build one. We've come a really long way towards understanding and controlling biology, and we could already do some really amazing things. Just look at the incredible scientific effort of creating a COVID vaccine in less than 12 months. But we're still not able to build biology from scratch. I work on creating artificial living cells from, from non-living materials like proteins and polymers. These will be the building blocks that we can hopefully one day use to build something that approaches life. So how do we actually do this? All life is comprised of cells. And a cell is the smallest indivisible unit that we can use to describe a living system. So let's start there by making a single cell. It's comprised of tens of millions of different kinds of molecules, all elegantly working together towards a common goal. Even though a cell is incredibly small, it is still an extremely complex autonomous system. A cell consists of lots of parts with many different functions. You probably already know of two. The nucleus, which contains all of the genetic information that a cell needs to function, and the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, that converts food into energy and the cell can use for other processes. These, along with other parts, allow for some of the core traits of life. Mobility, so that the cell can move around. Growth and division of the cell, the conversion of energy, and the processing of information. Last but not least, there is the membrane, the outer lining, which separates the inside of the cell from the outside world and allows materials to enter and exit the cell. This trait is called compartmentalization. As you can see, one single cell consists of lots of parts and has many different functions. Now you can begin to see how big this challenge is and how difficult it is to recreate life inside the lab. One approach is to try to mimic these traits individually before combining them and making an entire artificial cell. For example, making a system that is only capable of moving around by itself, or harvesting light energy and converting it to a chemical fuel. To recreate a cell, we first have to break it down even further and look at the molecules inside a cell and how they interact and build it up. It's important to know that the molecules in a cell use self-assembly to do this. Self-assembly is when molecules form a specific shape or structure without any extra guidance from the outside world, such as a scientist. The assembly instructions are contained within each molecule. Let's compare it to an imaginary magic Lego boat set. Instead of having to build the boat piece by piece with your hands, all you have to do is tip the whole thing into a bath of water and the pieces will come together by themselves to form a fully functional floating toy boat. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, it already exists in every living thing on our planet. If you want to make an artificial cell, you need to recreate this process on a molecular scale. This is what we do in the lab. We design molecules that self-assemble and stick to each other in a very certain way. We're going to call these specific special molecular structures our building blocks. But how can you make these molecules self-assemble? Let's go to the lab and find out. There are a few options, of course. One possible aspect from nature we can use is hydrophobicity. Some substances love water, others don't. You know this from when you mix oil and water together. In fact, they don't mix. So as you can see, the oil rapidly comes together and forms a separate phase from the water, floating on top. 
We can use this to our advantage. We can design molecules that have oily parts, hydrophobic, and water-loving parts, hydrophilic. By combining these water-loving and water-hating parts in one of our building blocks, we can cause it to self-assemble when the molecules interact with water. The water-loving molecules will react differently than the water-hating molecules, and therefore we can predict the resulting shape of the structure. Another option is electrostatics. Opposites attract. Just as two opposite poles of a magnet will attract, a positively charged molecule will be attracted to a negatively charged molecule. We can also make use of hydrogen bonds, which are really strong bonds between molecules. These hydrogen bonds play an essential role in biology, as they are responsible for the formation of the DNA double helix, which is actually two totally separate molecules bound together only if they have the matching genetic code. It is one of, if not the most specific, self-assembly processes known in chemistry. The final example I use for self-assembly is that of protein folding. Proteins are composed of chains of amino acids. The sequence and the chemical structure of the chain causes it to fold or self-assemble into a very specific shape using combinations of all the same interactions I just talked about. With these different self-assembly techniques, we can create an entire toolbox of molecular building blocks that we can pull out of to create the separate elements of our artificial cell. So all these interactions, the oil and water, the electrostatics and the hydrogen bonds, take place at the molecular scale. The molecules are literally nanometers apart. Cells are at least a thousand times bigger than this on the micron scale. What I've been doing recently is using these molecular scale interactions to build up bigger and bigger assemblies, using self-assembly, reaching towards the cell size now. As I mentioned before, one of the components that sets living things apart from non-living things is the membrane. In a cell, the membrane separates the outside from the inside. It's like the wall or the skin of a cell. What I focus on is recreating the membrane by making use of polymers. Polymers are what we mostly know as plastics. For better or for worse, plastics are everywhere in our modern world. In our phones, in our clothes, our packaging, our cars, our healthcare, everywhere. Plastics are made up of polymers, which are enormous molecules with a repetitive chemical structure. It's possible to make very special kinds of polymers that undergo self-assembly when you change their external environment. For example, when you place them in water. With these special types of plastics or polymers, we can start to create membranes that share a basic structure of the membrane in a natural cell. It separates the carefully balanced processes happening within the cell from the harsh outside world. Membranes in living systems are dynamic and host a huge range of functions apart from this simple separation. But people are working on that too. Here you can see a cartoon of the artificial cell that I've made. It has a thin polymer membrane that makes it an individual cell. It also protects the stuff inside from the outside world, just like a real cell. And the red shape represents cargo. We can and have loaded in all sorts of weird and wonderful functional cargo, like proteins, nanoparticles, and even DNA. Okay, so now I've got a membrane that keeps the inside separate from the outside, but we're still a really long way away from a living cell. However, now we can open our toolbox and start to add in more functional components to the artificial cell one by one. By adding functionalities, we can further approach a living cell. Remember the traits of living organisms like mobility and conversion of energy that we talked about in the beginning? Those are our goals. We can add in enzymes from nature or synthetic catalysts to the inside compartment. This allows certain very specific chemical reactions within the artificial cell to take place, just like in nature. And of course, living systems need energy. You need to eat, plants need to photosynthesize. So how do we feed our artificial cells? One way to do this is to add in light harvesting molecules. These special molecules absorb light and turn it into chemical energy, just like photosynthesis in plants. These energy rich molecules can be used by another process inside the artificial cell. The possibilities are literally endless. What if we want our artificial cell to move and to chase after food? Well, we can already kind of do this by adding tiny enzymatic motors so that the artificial cells can move around by themselves a trait essential for real cells as well, as you remember. With cutting edge artificial cells, we're still a long way from making living systems. But I think we've already come a long way. Doing these experiments, we learn more about the design rules. We don't have an instruction manual for building a cell. We're in the process of writing it via our experimentation. The creation of artificial cells is very interdisciplinary. I'm a polymer chemist, 
that makes fancy self-assembling plastics. But I work with mathematicians to make models of molecular phenomena, biochemists to make interesting proteins, and tissue engineers to explore future applications. It's a very challenging problem that requires lots of different expertises. This sounds a bit like science fiction, and you might even find it a bit scary that we could one day make life in the lab. But I wouldn't worry if I were you. I'm not. We're still a very long way away from real life, and we'll be very careful, I promise. In any case, the potential benefits are tantalizing, and we will be using our artificial selves to solve problems in society, long before they are able to divide and grow themselves. I mean, just imagine if we could make a cell in the lab by our own design. The possibility is limitless. All of biology is built in the chemistry and physics of individual non-living components working together in elegant yet frighteningly complex ways. If we also had a complete detailed molecular level understanding of how life works, we would have an unprecedented level of control over biology. The ability to create a cell with any desired function could be a really powerful tool to solve many challenges we face in today's society. For example, we could make an artificial kidney that could filter blood. And then people who suffer chronic kidney disease, who are waiting on a transplant list and spend 12 plus hours every week hooked up to a dialysis machine, these people would be able to live a much longer, better and healthier life. Or we can make an artificial cell that releases medicine at a very specific location in the body, but also at a specific time, leading to much better outcomes when treating difficult human diseases like cancer. By creating life in the lab, we also gain an insight into the origin of life on Earth. Of course, there are several competing theories about how life originated. If we can make life in the lab, however, then I think that we'll provide some guidelines of how this might have happened during early Earth history. So, can we create life in a lab? Not yet, but we're working on it. By experimenting with different techniques and components, and in my case with polymers, we're continuously expanding the toolbox which we can use to one day, maybe, build living systems. If we succeed, we can work on new therapies, artificial organs, and perhaps understand a little bit more about the origin of life. Thank you for listening.